Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at exam style questions for the chromatography practical. Hi guys, in this video we'll be going through some exam style questions based around the planning and implementation stages of this chromatography practical. So I'll read through the questions here and then we'll go through the different parts of the question and we'll go through the answers accordingly. So it says aspirin tablets are prescribed to patients with particular heart conditions. Bisoprolol is another tablet for heart problems. A student wishes to compare which ingredients make up these two tablets using thin layer chromatography. Part A says describe a method they can use to perform TLC to determine and compare the molecules present in the tablets. So it looks a bit daunting because this is obviously a 10 mark question, but these method questions can be quite big. However, when you break down the method into a, almost a kind of story from start to finish, from setup to collecting results, there are lots and lots of points to make. So you soon find that once you begin writing your list, you can soon see that there are actually probably a lot more than 10 marks you can pick up on. So essentially they've got two tablets, they're using chromatography to see which ingredients are in each of them, and they want to perform a method that will allow them to compare these ingredients within both of the tablets. So I'll show you what I've done in terms of a method and see what points you can pick up from it. So the first thing I've mentioned is a safety thing which should be carried out throughout the whole practical, so I thought it would be appropriate to put it at the beginning, and that's just to wear goggles and gloves. We don't know anything about these tablets, you may not have heard of these tablets before, and the students certainly don't know what active ingredients are within them, and let alone whether they're uh, reactive to them or whether they would become toxic or corrosive to them. So wearing goggles and gloves is an essential for most practicals, especially this one. And then I've put for both tablets, crush them within a pestle and mortar or in a watch glass. In a similar way to the chloroplast experiment that we've been through in other videos, we need to make this sample into a form that can be dissolved into a solvent so that all the constituents will be free. So we need to take the tablets as they were and crush them so that they're no longer in a fixed form. So that's another point there. I then put mix each tablet with an appropriate solvent. So the solvent's a very important point you have to make because this is the way that all of the constituent molecules will be able to be free of it and independent of each other so that they can move across the stationary phase and be separated out and identified. And that's another mark there. Number four, I've put mark on each TLC plate a line 10 millimeters from one end and a dot in the center of the line using pencil. So that's possibly one or two marks there. The line's very important because that's the way that we measure the distance the pigment and the solvent front has moved. If we didn't have that line, we wouldn't know how far they go, so we wouldn't be able to attain any results at all. And using pencil is very important, as we said in the implementation stage, because if we use pen, then the ink pigments can run with our other pigments and confuse the results. Number five, I put to apply to its own plate the dissolved tablet using a fine capillary tube. So that's another mark, adding a drop by a capillary tube. Keep adding drops once the previous has dried until the spot is two millimeters wide. So again, that's another point there, just to make sure that we've added the spot until it's a particular size. And then for each TLC plate assigned to its own tablet, we need to place them into the split bung, and then lower the plate, which is the stationary phase, into a beaker of the appropriate solvent, which will act as the mobile phase. We don't know what the solvent would be here, but as long as you acknowledge that you need to dip the stationary phase into a mobile phase, that's the main process of chromatography, which is what they're trying to get out of you here. The solvent must be below the 10 millimeter line, and you could elaborate on that and say that this is because if it was above, the pigments may spread downwards as well as upwards, which would affect the distances that we get, and therefore affect our results as well. So the final few points that I've covered here then, are to allow the chromatogram to form until the solvent front is about 10 millimeters from the end. And then again, you could elaborate on saying that if it goes beyond the end, we don't know our distances are for sure because we don't know how far it would have traveled as well. I've then said photograph immediately. And then number nine or number 10, however many points you've managed to make out of this, compare the chromatograms and the retention factor values to compare constituent molecules. Use UV light or dyes for any colorless compounds, as we said in the background video, because some of them don't show up by eye. So even though I've put nine steps here, you could easily make 11 or 12 out of these, but as long as you cover the main points in the idea that you crush the sample to make all of the constituents free, dissolve it in a solvent, you prepare a stationary plate with a clear line to measure distances, you place that into a very fixed split bung, add that to the mobile phase with an appropriate solvent, allow the chromatogram to form, take a photograph, and then use the RF values to compare the tablets. As long as you cover those points, then you should be absolutely fine, and it should be no problem to pick up those 10 marks. Part B then says, for TLC, which again is thin layer chromatography, state three variables that need to be controlled. So this is only three marks, and it will literally just be a case of stating these variables as they are. So controls that I've listed here, 
include the temperature of the system or the lab, because as we know, temperature can affect how pigments move. The molecules may evaporate at different temperatures, so it has to be the same every time, and the same for both tablets that we're studying here. The volume of the mobile phase solvent, and the humidity of the lab as well. You could also talk about perhaps the pH of the solvent, or the, the amount of tablet that we add. Anything that must be stayed the same for a logical reason would be acceptable here. So it then says the results are shown here. So we've got aspirin table on the left and bisoprolol's table on the right. So each of the tables states what we would expect for a chromatography experiment. We've got the color of each of the pigments observed, how far they moved, and then how far they moved compared to the solvent front, or basically how far the solvent front itself moved. And then we've got exactly the same for the bisoprolol tablet as well. So part C of the question says, calculate the retention factor for aspirin's light blue and green pigments. So always read the question word for word. You have to make sure that you've got the right table, the right particular pigments, and you know exactly what they're asking of you. So we'll go through how to work out retention factor. So whenever I approach a maths question, I always write the general formula so that the examiner knows I'm familiar with this formula and that he can give me that mark straight away. So I've put that the retention factor equals the distance moved by the pigment. So I put a big D next to pigment there. And then the distance moved by the solvent. So for aspirin's light blue, I put the distance the pigment moves, which is 31 millimeters, divided by the solvent front, which is 60 millimeters. And plugging that into your calculator, you get a retention factor of 0.52. And then if you do the same for the green pigment, the same again, it's moved 34 millimeters over 60 millimeters, which turns out to be 0 0.57. So remember, there's no units for retention factor. It's just a ratio of how far the pigment moved compared to how far the solvent front moved. So those two answers are fine. I'd leave them exactly to two decimal places if you can. Both of them should be at the same degree of accuracy, unless they state here what degree of accuracy you need to do. But I would always say one or two decimal places is appropriate. Since retention factor is only ever between 0 and 1, to give more of a range, I would usually give two decimal places, whereas three or four would be much too precise. So part D then says, the retention factors are shown here. So we've now got all of the tables with calculated retention factor in them. It says, based on the data, identify the two pigments which are present in both heart medications. So we need to look at the tables, each of the medications, and find the two pigments that have the same retention factor in each of the tables. So the ones that are identical are this one, which is 0.52 there and there. And we've also got the 0.78 retention factors cropping up twice as well. So the two pigments that we've got are light blue, and we've also got violet. So the answer to this question then would be the light blue pigment and the violet pigment. Part E then says, online sources state that these medications share more common ingredients than those the students have noticed. Suggest why they were not all picked up in the results. So it's basically asking you why certain ingredients that are common between the tablets, not all of them showed up in this student's experiment. So we need to evaluate the experiment and the method they used and talk about how these may have gone unnoticed. So I'll show you the points that I've written here. I've put firstly that some ingredients may only form a colorless spot upon the plate. In this way, they may not have been noticed as a constituent. So we talked about how we can use staining methods to identify the colorless pigments, but they may not have done this and there's no mention of it here. So a good suggestion is by saying that because they're colourless, we wouldn't have noticed them on the stationary phase. Because this is four marks, I always think about two reasons and each of them having one explanation to cover the four marks. So a colourless pigment, which means that it wouldn't have got noticed because it wouldn't have been seen. So that's good enough for two marks there. The second point I've put is that some pigments may overlap due to having the same size or polarity, which means they have the same retention factor. And therefore they may be counted just as one pigment. So this is another thing, we could have two active ingredients that are the same, but because they appear under one dot, they just got noticed as being one. So always make a point and then elaborate it in more detail as you go through. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.